we are going to talk about the big bad middle. Hey everybody, welcome back to Fiction Technician. If you haven't been here before, my name is Jane Kalmus. I am a writer of historical cozy mysteries and today I'm talking to you about how to write the midpoint of your book. Okay, don't get scared. All right, I know midpoints are tough. Uh, for me, they're the hardest plot point to nail down and I think that's partly because there's so much writing on them and there are so many di different directions in which you can take them. So uh, you know that I like to get super techie on this uh, channel and kind of tell you here's how you do this and here's how you do that. It's hard to do that with the midpoint because there are so many options. But I promise you I'm not letting you leave today without three distinct ways that you can approach the midpoint and try to find the one that really works for your book. So let's look at the structure for a basic story and talk about why the midpoint can be so challenging. All right, here we've got a basic, basic outline for how a story in a novel typically progresses. We don't have all of the beats laid out, but we've got the basics. Uh, there's going to be a catalyst, otherwise known as an inciting incident, that will make our protagonist feel like he should act. He's going to choose to accept the challenge uh, provided by this catalyst and move forward and he's going to begin making progress toward his goal. Then we've got the midpoint and we're going to talk about that more in a little bit but after the midpoint comes a time when he begins to encounter bigger obstacles in pursuing his goal. He will double down and recommit uh, digging in and giving everything he's got to reach the finale. And that's the end of the story. So you can see that this is all a very linear, logical progression, except for the midpoint. Uh, the midpoint is kind of the odd man out. And that's because to me, the purpose of the midpoint is to break up this logical linear progression and send us shooting off in some unpredictable direction or another. We like as readers, logical storytelling. We have no problem with it. It's just we can't endure it for too long or we start to get bored. This is why short stories and novellas don't really need a midpoint, but a novel definitely does. A novel that has strictly a linear progression is just going to feel a little saggy in the middle. It's going to feel like you never gave us any delightful surprises. So that's why when I'm planning a book, I don't even refer to this plot point as the midpoint. What I call it is a place of change. And that's just to remind myself that at this point, I want to shake things up for the reader. There are all sorts of things that you can change at this point that will really give the story a different flavor. You can change the environments in which your characters are. George Lucas used to always do this in his Star Wars movies. We'd go from running around Jabba's palace to running around the forest of Endor, and it was a nice, refreshing change. You can change their character relationships. Maybe an ally will become an enemy or vice versa. You can change their goals or their status, but whatever it is, you want to kind of give the reader a delightful surprise. So that's the magic of the midpoint, but it's also kind of the problem with it because uh, it can be very difficult to choose exactly the perfect one. Uh, so when you're planning, if you know basically the idea of your story, there are only maybe a couple of things that make sense for the catalyst, maybe two or three possibilities for the finale, but the midpoint is kind of a big open sandbox and it can be really difficult to figure out exactly what you want to build there. The most consistent advice that you're going to see about how to write the midpoint is that you should be raising the stakes for the character at this point. So when we raise the stakes, we mean that the character has more to lose now than they did before the midpoint. Uh, perhaps you have a character who's trying to land a big client and they're afraid that if they fail, they will lose their job. Well, at the midpoint, they might find out that their bosses work for the mafia and so it's not just a matter of losing their job, they may actually lose their life. So we always want to be doing this at the midpoint, but we are going to get a little more techie with it and I'm going to give you three ways to look at the midpoint and we're going to call them the bad ending, the dragon descends, and deeper in. Okay, but before we get started, if you like my work and you like what I'm putting out on this channel, please like this video, uh, subscribe if you haven't, but if you really want to help me out, the best thing you can do is share this video on social media or with a writer who you think would enjoy it. All right, let's talk about the bad ending. So the bad ending midpoint is when we figure out how our story would end if it were a tragedy, uh, if we wanted a really sad down ending. Uh, but then after the midpoint, we will allow our character to rally to complete the second half of the book. 
So let's pretend that it's the early 1980s and we're plotting out the first draft of a novel called Ender's Game. It's about a boy of incredible tactical abilities who is sent away to battle school in order to learn how to fight off a invasion from an alien species known as the Buggers. Okay, how could we end this story if we wanted it to be a tragedy? Well, Ender has a lot of conflicts with his classmates. They are older and more experienced than he, and so they feel they should be doing better than him, and they resent his natural abilities and success. So we might say that Ender is attacked by one of these classmates and killed. That would certainly be a tragedy, but maybe a little too much of one because it doesn't give Ender the opportunity to rally and finish the story. So let's flip that around. Let's say that instead he is attacked by a classmate and kills him and is devastated and leaves battle school forever. That's exactly what happens at the midpoint of Ender's game. Ender is attacked by Bonzo Madrid. He accidentally kills him and the trauma of this causes him to leave. Now, he will eventually be encouraged by his sister and rally and go on to defeat the buggers and that's how we get the second half of the novel. Another example of the bad ending midpoint is The Red Wedding. Okay, I know in the TV show, Game of Thrones, the Red Wedding was at the end of a season, uh, but in the book, A Storm of Swords, it's the midpoint. And at this point, the series is all about the conflict between the clan of Stark and the clan of Lannister. And at the Red Wedding, Rob Stark, the leader of the Starks, and many of his compatriots go off to celebrate a wedding and are slaughtered mercilessly. Uh, so we can easily see how that might have been the tragic end of the story. Stark's out. Uh, but luckily, after that point, the characters rally. I mean, not these characters. Uh, those characters are dead. But the larger group of characters to whom they belong, the Stark clan, rally. And so the story continues. The next kind of midpoint I want to talk about is called The Dragon Descends. Okay, this is for a story where we, the readers, have been watching some great danger hover over our characters, just like a big dragon up in the sky. And at the midpoint, it comes crashing down on them. Uh, this is the kind of midpoint that Jurassic Park has. We have spent the whole first half of the movie looking at dinosaurs and petting dinosaurs. Uh, but even if we had seen no previews and knew nothing about the franchise, we would know that at some point we were going to be attacked by those dinosaurs. And that is what happens at the midpoint. Uh, this is also the kind of midpoint you see in Alien. Alien is very similar. We spend the entire first half of the movie finding out about the aliens. Um, the first alien we meet latches onto a character's face, but then it falls off and everything seems to be fine. And then at the midpoint, but in case you think that this kind of midpoint is just for monster flicks, uh, this is also the kind of midpoint we see in a lot of traditional mysteries. We will spend the whole first half of the mystery watching a group of characters come together, exchange barbs, focus on their old grudges, and at the midpoint, all of that bad blood will descend on us in the form of a murder. And if you want a Dragon Descends moment with no blood or guts, uh, we could look at Kramer versus Kramer. So in Kramer versus Kramer, in the first moments of the movie, Joanne Kramer leaves her husband and son to go off and pursue a life on her own. And the first half of the movie shows her husband, Ted Kramer, learning how to be a loving father to his son. Uh, but we've still got this big dragon of family instability hanging over us and it descends at the midpoint when Joanne comes back and says that she wants to gain custody of their son. And the last type of midpoint that I want to talk about today is when I call deeper in. So Jurassic Park was obviously an example of the dragon descends, but it's also an example of deeper in, which is a midpoint in which we allow the characters and the readers deeper into the special world of the story. Okay, many stories take place in special worlds, whether it's the special world of dinosaurs like in Jurassic Park or a more prosaic uh, everyday kind of special world like the special world of comic book conventions or even knitting circles. So in Jurassic Park, that definitely happens. Uh, again, we've spent the first half of the movie looking at dragons from a safe dinosaurs from a safe distance, um, but in the second half we will be sleeping alongside them, running with them, and getting our arms ripped off by them. So we're deeper into the special world. This is also the kind of midpoint we see in The Matrix, where our protagonist, Neo, enters the Matrix as an operative for the very first time. 
I've been watching a lot of midpoints lately and the deeper in midpoints do tend to be a little bit quieter and less surprising than the others. Uh, for example, in a lot of superhero picks, we actually see deeper in moments. Uh, in the 2002 Spider-Man, at the midpoint, Peter Parker commits to the idea of being a superhero who will help people instead of just a guy with powers using them for his own benefit. So this is definitely a midpoint. It changes everything for Peter and it gets us deeper into the special world of being a superhero. But it does honestly feel like a logical linear progression from fledgling superhero to professional superhero. So I encourage you to think about ways to combine the deeper in midpoint with a bit of a surprise or just be aware that it's going to be kind of a quieter midpoint. Now I want to be clear that the midpoint does not have to do all the work of giving our reader surprises and making sure that the second half of our book is showing them something new. For example, in Ender's Game, uh, we did have that bad ending midpoint, but immediately after that, Ender goes deeper into the special world of combat training. Instead of going back to battle school, he goes to an advanced combat camp where he learns a whole new, more intense kind of battle training. I'm not going to try to tell you that these three ways to look at the midpoint are the only ways to do it. Okay, this is a wonderful moment at the middle of your book that is rife with possibility and you should feel free to take it in any direction you choose. But I hope that these three perspectives will kind of uh, help grease the wheels of your creativity and help you write your way to an amazing midpoint. Check out.